morning, everybody. I am Abby Elizabeth, and this is the Urban Vessels YouTube channel. This channel is for Christian women, but anyone is welcome to listen. Many of you have written to me about some different things, and when I was in prayer about it, I realized that there was a common thread that went through all of the situations that I was being presented with, or at least most of them. And so I thought to uh, address some of these things in public video. So what I want to talk to you all about is how to deal with a rebellious husband. Now, in, in the world of being a Christian, and we recognize that not everyone who claims to be a Christian is a Christian, the person who is truly a Christian is someone who has obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ been baptized in his name for the remission of sins and received the Holy Ghost. However, there are many religious people who think themselves to be Christians who don't even know Jesus Christ. They think that he is either a oneness or a trinity. And neither of those doctrines are true. Verily, they are heresies. And some of us as women have come into the faith of Jesus Christ having already been married. And some of us are in a situation where we are married to a man who thinks himself to be a Christian and yet is not. For this reason, it, it, this is a very difficult thing for, for a Christian woman to handle, particularly when she's young in faith. And I am not without sympathy about this. So please understand that I'm going to say some things that are going to be hard to hear, but they're necessary. They're necessary for you to be able, my sisters, to be able to enter into the kingdom of heaven. And there are not any excuses when we stand before the, the Son of God. So when we stand before the throne of judgment and Jesus Christ is sitting on that throne and we are judged by the Holy Spirit of his Father that dwells in him, there will be no excuses. So, for example, if we are thinking in our heart, well, the scripture commands in Ephesians 5 that a woman should be in subjection unto her husband as unto the Lord. And so that is now presented to the Lord as an excuse as to why we were not obedient about what the word says. Then we will be cast from him. And, and he will say unto us, depart from me. I never knew you, ye that work iniquity. Now, the first thing I want to say, and I don't want to make this video very long because I, I've addressed these things before, but then I don't want to shortchange you on the word of God either. Ephesians chapter five is talking about a man and a woman who are both Christians who are married. So it's speaking to Christians husbands and wives, both of them being Christians. And one thing we can recognize from the get-go is that if someone doesn't know Jesus Christ, so if our husband does not know Jesus Christ, they think, for, for example, that he is a Babylonian deity known as God the Son, that a man in that condition cannot stand in the office of Jesus Christ. And we, Christian women who do know who Jesus Christ is, are going to have a bit of a difficult walk because many religious men demand complete subjection from their wives, knowing what is written in the scripture, but they're not Christians. And the things that they expect us to do sometimes are contrary to what Jesus Christ commands us to do. A husband, who is not yet in the faith of Jesus Christ, is not able to stand in the office of Jesus Christ unto his wife because he is not in the faith. And it's a little bit confusing because if we're married to an ungodly man who doesn't profess to be a Christian, and this is the case with some of you as well, that we realize that he's not a Christian and obviously we cannot do everything that he commands us to do. For example, an ungodly man who is not even thinking himself to be a Christian might command us to do something illegal. 
he might command us to serve him as he serves the mafia, for example, and we would not do that. Or he might command us to uh, bow down before a statue of Buddha or to clean the statue of Buddha. And a Christian woman would do neither. And those things are more obvious. But when a, a religious man who thinks himself mistakenly to be a Christian expects us as Christian women to do things such as decorate his Christmas tree, wrap Christmas presents for family members, um, attend birthday parties and sing happy birthday party, pardon me, happy birthday to our children. When he expects us to not wear a head covering when in public or to perhaps uh, compromise about the head covering and not fully cover ourselves, to not wear women's clothing in some circumstances. And there are our religious men who do command their wives to do such things. But this is an example of something that is less clear. Because if a man is going to a so-called church once a week, he may even serve as the pastor or in some other office in that church. It's very hard for us to recognize that, that even though he might have a good heart and want to serve the Lord, he doesn't know Jesus Christ yet. And so when he expects us to do things that are in service to his false deities, we must gracefully and politely say no. Now I have other videos about that, so I'm not going to go into that in particular. I want to begin now. Let's go to the Word of God and let's read in Genesis chapter 3 and verses 16 through 19. And may the Lord bless the reading of his Word. This particular passage is when God placed the curse upon Eve. And this curse has been placed on every single female since then, myself included. So I'm not unfamiliar at all with these things, but perhaps I can help you out a little bit, my sisters, because I've been walking with the Lord a little bit longer than you have, perhaps. So let's read in verse 6. Um, let's read in verse 16. Unto the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. This is the curse that was placed upon Eve and every single woman who has lived since then. We can see a few things here that happened then to women that were not our original condition. These are all penalties for what Eve did, which was to, to disobey God, not ask her husband as she should have. And what she ended up doing was condemning all that were in her, her body that would be the future generations of women. So Eve chose to eat the forbidden fruit. She was enticed by the theology of the serpent who, who, who convinced her that would, because it was pretty to look at, because it might taste good and it would make her wise, that she decided without consulting her husband to partake of something that God forbade. This was the original sin of the woman. We need to recognize a few things about this. First of all, she was deceived. She did not have enough understanding to make that decision herself. And so rather than go to her husband, she made a decision independent from her husband. For that reason, for that reason, these are the consequences. All of these are consequences. They are not the natural state of the woman, although they're related to the natural state of the woman, because obviously a woman was made for her husband. She was made to be a suitable servant unto him. She was made to bring forth children. But all of these things now have pain associated with them. Let's read this again. Unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow 
thou shalt bring forth children. So one of the things we can see that's a curse upon women is that their physical body suffers with the parts of themselves that have to do with pregnancy and childbirth. So a woman's menstrual cycle can often be painful. She can have a lot of difficulty emotionally at that particular time. She can suffer physically with cramping and so forth. Another thing that happens is that a woman, it says here, and I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. So this is speaking about how women become pregnant easily and they often bring forth many children. And when this happens, a woman has sorrow. She sees her children sometimes suffering with sin. She sees her children sometimes as Eve did, even becoming murderers. So Eve brought forth Cain and Cain was a murderer. And sometimes women, because they bring forth many children, suffer with witnessing the consequences of sin in their sons and daughters. That's one thing this is referring to. The multiplying of sorrow and the multiplying of conception. Another thing that happens with the multiplying of, of conception is a woman gives of her own strength to bear children. And, you know, in the first baby that we have, we're young and we're strong and we have a lot of um, ability to give from our own body unto that child. And that starts with pregnancy and then thereafter is with breastfeeding that child. But over time, the more children that we have, our, our, our body can become depleted. Our bones can become weak and we can become worn out, not only physically because of the actual gestation of a pregnancy, but also with nurturing an infant with our own flesh. But another thing that happens is we can become emotionally weary. We can become sorrowful. We can struggle with things such as sorrow, depression, anxiety about what's happening with our children, what's happening with us. And it's a, a, a very grievous burden. It's the curse that has been put upon women. It's not just about having cramps during your menstrual cycle. And it is not only about childbirth being painful. It's about the whole process of being a vessel for the seed, being turned from something that originally would have brought the woman much joy. It wouldn't have been painful and it wouldn't have been full of sorrow because obviously if the woman didn't sin, her children would not be born sinners. Now let's re I want to now particularly focus on the final penalty that was placed upon women. So women were always made to serve thy hus their husband, and they were always made to be in subjection to their husband. This is true, and, and I'm not denying that. However, this is not the curse that is being spoken of here. And thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. Many people misunderstand this verse and they think that this was the way women would have always been if there had been no sin. And while, yes, I want to just emphasize here, a woman was always made to be a suitable servant to her husband. She was not made originally to have her desire be to her husband or for him to rule over her. What does it mean? Someone asked me recently what it means that a woman's desire is unto her husband. Well, basically it manifests two ways and all women struggle with these things. Every single woman struggles with these things and I am a woman too. So I'm speaking to you from experience and not in any way to be condescending. But the desire unto the husband manifests in two ways. One is to envy him to resent him, to want to be able to do what he does and be in a, a condition of resentment and bitterness about one's own lot. So what is the lot of a woman? To bring forth children, 
to suffer with that, to be sorrowful about that, and to be ruled over by her husband. And a lot of women resent this. And rather than accept that this is their lot and their condition in this world, it's, it's the cross that we as women bear, they instead try to become men. And there are various ways this manifests. They don't want to wear women's clothing. They want to get a man's job. They want to order their husband around. They want to be an equal team. They, they want to um, constantly be in a condition of resistance against what God has ordained for the woman in a different way. This is different than what would have been if Eve hadn't sinned. So Eve would not have been in a condition of envying Adam. She would have been delighting in what God made her to be. That is one way that this manifests. And not that there aren't other ways, but there's two that are in particular. Or most things fall under these two categories. The other way that having one's desire be to thy husband is to be overly dependent upon a man for every single thing that we do. So a woman can also then swing way over to the other side and be kind, become kind of helpless. And this frequently manifests as being emotionally manipulative. So the, the woman, rather than, than act as a dignified and, and um, wise servant of the Lord Jesus Christ, instead, she acts like a victim. So she's like, well, I, I just can't handle these children. I just can't manage to, to be um, doing what the Lord would have me do regarding the household. It's always in chaos. It's always a situation where her husband is attending to her emotions rather than her being a servant unto her husband. So when a woman's desire is unto her husband as the penalty for her sin, it's either to, to resent her husband and want what he has, or it is to try to gain power by emotionally manipulating her husband and making herself and, and things that shouldn't be difficult, very difficult for him. And both of these situations end up with the woman being exalted over the man, either through feminism or through being emotionally manipulated and kind of a victim. Now, when we are Christian women and we have obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ, we don't want to conduct ourselves in either of these ways, even though it is God's consequence upon us. We, we will struggle with these things. So I'm not saying that, that when we become a Christian that we automatically don't struggle with these things. This is the condition of our fallen flesh, and it is our cross to bear as a woman. So what do we do? Well, the first thing is we recognize that neither of these heart conditions are pleasing to the Lord. And we as Christians are expected to overcome our flesh. So I want to go now to, let's go to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2, and let's read here. Uh, let's start in verse, let's start in verse 10. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth. That every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. In these two verses, we can first understand that Jesus Christ is not part of a trinity or part of a oneness. He is our Lord and our Master. And when we confess that He is Lord and we bow down before Him, in other words, we serve Him according to the Holy Scripture, that then we understand who Jesus Christ is and our tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And God the Father is the only God. There is no other God. There is no deity known as God the Son. 
There is no deity known as God, the Holy Spirit. The heavenly Father of all who, who love him, all who have been begotten by his word and obeyed his gospel, our heavenly Father is Jesus Christ. Our heavenly Father is a spirit, and that spirit was fully manifested in a man. Someone who doesn't know this and has not yet obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ, while they might say the name of Jesus and they might think that they're a Christian, they are not. Now let's read on. Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. There's one thing I want to emphasize about this passage. Most people are familiar with this scripture. First, the Apostle Paul is writing that we need to be obedient to God's word and not just when other people approve of it or when other people are helping us. So he writes here, Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. So the first step in being a Christian is self-examination and submission, subjection to the principles contained in Scripture. That is how we walk as a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ said, if ye continue in my word, then ye are my disciples indeed. Jesus Christ said, My mother and my brethren are these which hear the word of God and do it. So we are all responsible to conduct ourselves according to the principles contained in Scripture. And for Christian women, what that means is that we walk the way holy women have walked. And it's not about what other people think of us and it's not even about what our husband thinks of us particularly if we are married to someone who is in rebellion a man who refuses having heard our testimony having when we covered our head and showed our husband from the holy bible how it is that a person is saved when we've referred him perhaps to brother clinton's videos about how there is no trinity and how there is no oneness there is one god and one mediator between god and men the man christ jesus if our husband has been exposed to the truth and he is yet in rebellion against that then we as christian women need to remember that we still need to hold ourselves to the commandments of scripture so i get presented with a lot of what if scenarios a lot of um, kind of I can't help it so a lot of people say things to me like well my husband has commanded me to wear pants or my husband has commanded me to trim the Christmas tree with a family and if I don't do these things whatever it is he's commanding her to do that is contrary to the word of God that if I don't do these things, he'll throw me out. And he's saying to me things like from Ephesians 5, so I'm going to just go there so to show how the scripture can be misused. Ephesians 5 and verse 22, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. Well, this is a commandment in scripture. But a man who doesn't know the Lord cannot stand in that office. So if you're married to a man who thinks that, that you, as his wife, need to dress according to what he wants, which is contrary to the scripture, he wants you to wear pants in public, he wants you to uncover your hair, he wants you to do all kinds of things that are contrary to what the scripture commands. And I'm referring specifically here to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And I'm not going to read that for you right now. But basically, our husband is commanding us to be disobedient to God. And obviously, 
in that situation, we cannot be obedient. So how do we deal with a husband like this? Well, let's go to 1 Peter chapter 3. And let's read beginning in verse 1. Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, so this is talking about a rebellious husband here. If any obey not the word, they also may, without the word, be won by the conversation of the wives, while they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear. So I want to read this again. If any obey not the word, they also may, without the word, be won by the conversation of the wives. What does this mean? Well, this is that a, a Christian sister doesn't try to teach her husband, obviously. Christian women are commanded to learn in silence with all subjection and not to usurp authority or to teach a man and certainly not their husband. So if we're married to someone who is not yet in the faith, we don't try to teach them. We might testify to them about our faith. And I would advise you, my sisters, to approach your husband in humility, to as much as possible behave as Abigail did with King David. So Abigail, when she approached him, didn't approach him um, on an eye-to-eye -eye equal footing with her hand on her hip, <clears throat> pardon me, with her hand on her hip, instructing David about how he was wrong and she was right. So the first thing is that we hold ourselves in the principles about how godly women behave. Now a godly woman's behavior is about things like having a meek and quiet spirit, which in the sight of God is of great value. It's about dressing modestly. It's about recognizing that a woman was not ordained to be a teacher, to be a pastor, to have religious authority over a husband or any other man, that she is commanded to walk in holiness as godly women always have walked. And these days, we as Christian women can't usually learn that from our parents. We have to learn that instead by reading the Word of God. That's the place where we will find it, or you can find it here on this channel. So we read in 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 2, while they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear. This chaste conversation we just read is without the word. So we live according to the scripture and our conversation is chaste. In other words, we don't try to lord over our husband. We don't act spiritually superior to him. We conduct ourselves as humble servants unto our husband, even though he is not yet in the faith. And we don't try to find fault with him and find reasons and excuses not to serve him. So the various ways a woman serves her husband is she she prepares meals for his for the family and for her husband that everyone can enjoy. She keeps the house clean and orderly so that it's a place where people can feel at peace and function properly. She might tend to the garden. She might make clothing for family members. And she educates and instructs the children in the ways of holiness. And as much as possible, she does all these things under the headship of her husband. So she does so in such a way as to please him. In other words, he recognizes that God has ordained it to be in this time that her desire be unto her husband. And so she channels that and tries to please her husband in any way that she can up to and, and not further than, pardon me, up to the point where her husband departs from things that the scripture would command her to do. So obviously if your husband is commanding you to decorate a Christmas tree, one would need to decline. If he's commanding you not to cover your hair, especially when you pray or prophesy, but all Christians are commanded to pray without ceasing. So if he doesn't like your veil and he wants you to have your hair out, 
if he's going to throw you out of the house because you're not going to obey him on that point, then that's the way it has to be. Because all Christians are commanded to choose. Now I want to read just a little further here. Verse 3, whose adorning let it not be, the outward adorning of plaiting the hair and of wearing of gold or of putting on of apparel, but let it be the hidden man of the heart in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. For after this manner in the old time, the holy women also, who trusted in God, adorned themselves with a meek and quiet spirit. It's not talking so much here about clothing or jewelry or about um, how we do our hair. It's about our personality, our character, with a meek and quiet spirit who trusted in God, adorned themselves being in subjection unto their own husbands, even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters he are, as long as ye do well, as long as ye do well, and are not afraid with any amazement. So I want to speak to this part here, where it says, as long as ye do well, and are not afraid with any amazement. What does this mean? This means, for a Christian sister, this means that we do what is righteous and holy according to the word of God. So doing well would include wearing women's clothing, covering our heads, being in subjection to our husband, not trying to lord it over him, not becoming a pastor unto our own husband or religious authority, not making our emotions the center of attention. As long as you do well and are not afraid with any amazement. You know, I see a lot of sisters behaving with fear that is like amazement. So they're just, they're just always upset. They have an attitude of helplessness and dependency and they end up tormenting the, their husband and anyone that they deal with because they are not, they are not walking according to what the scripture commands to every Christian. I want to go back now. Let's read again now in Philippians 2. Philippians 2. You see, just because we're women, and just because we're emotional creatures, and just because we have a cross to bear, is not a reason for us to be upset all the time and try to dominate everyone with how, how tragic we feel about things. We, as all Christians, are commanded to overcome our flesh. And this is a particular thing in a woman's flesh that I see quite a bit of. And I had it myself. So I, I'm, not, I'm not saying this to be superior. I'm saying this to help you. Philippians 2, verse 12. Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, so not just because people see it and appreciate it, we do what is obedient and good and right according to the Holy Scripture, whether or not anyone appreciates it. As a matter of fact, we do what is good and holy and right, even if people hate us and kill us for it. And we don't make this some kind of big emotional production either. So, but now, much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Let's read on. Do all things without murmurings and disputings. So this means not complaining and not arguing. That they, that ye may be blameless and harmless. The sons of God without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation among whom ye shine as lights in the world. A Christian woman who is married to a rebellious husband is still required to be obedient about every single thing that is commanded to all Christians. This includes recognizing that her salvation is her business. It's not her husband's business. And his salvation is his business. It's not her business. 
Rather, she's there to be a servant unto him, regardless of his spiritual condition. And she should be in subjection to him in all things, up to the point where he steps outside of, of the role of Jesus Christ and now is commanding her to do things that Jesus Christ would never command, you see. And this is particularly difficult for women who are married to religious men who think themselves to be Christians. And when he commands us, for example, a, a, a man who is not in the faith of Jesus Christ yet does not understand who Jesus is and is commanding us, say, to decorate the Christmas tree. We don't say, I can't do that. You're wrong. The scripture says thus and so, and I'm not even going to talk to you until you stop asking me to do this. That kind of attitude is incorrect. It's being wrong about being right. You see what I mean about that? It's the wrong stance and the wrong attitude, even though the sister in this case might be right. Instead, what she needs to say is, my husband, I'm very sorry, but I cannot partake of that. And um, when you have the time, I'd like to talk to you about that, because I, in no way do I mean to disrespect you. And then perhaps when he has time, if he wants to make time, she can go to him, her head covered, sitting at his feet, looking up at him as Abigail looked up at David and say to him, my husband, I cannot do this thing because the, the Christmas celebration is a pagan festival and God has commanded us all, thou shalt have no other gods before me. Beside me, I know no other God. And I know that you don't agree with me about that. And I want very much to serve you and to be pleasing unto you. But my husband, this I cannot do. It's a matter of my faith. It's my matter, a matter of my faith. And if he becomes enraged and he throws you out of the house, then, then let's go to 1 Corinthians. Go to 1 Corinthians here. And let's go to... Uh, Hold on just a moment. Let's read in chapter 7, beginning in verse 11 or verse 10. And unto the married I command, yet not I, but the Lord, let not the wife depart from her husband. But, and if she depart, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband. And let not the husband put away his wife. But to the rest speak I, not the Lord, if any brother hath a wife that believeth not, and she be pleased to dwell with him, let him not put her away. Verse 13, and the woman, okay, this is speaking to you, my sisters, who are dealing with this problem. And the woman which hath an husband that believeth not, and if he be pleased to dwell with her, let her not leave him. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Else were your children unclean, but now they are holy. But if the unbelieving depart, and what I would say is that when an unbelieving husband, someone who doesn't know Jesus Christ, throws you out of his house, he is departing. And I know that it's not actually that he's the one leaving the house, but he's departing from you. He is saying, I don't want to be a husband unto you. He is depriving you of what you're entitled to, a roof over your head and your food and raiment and your duty of marriage. He is punishing you for your righteousness and he's departing. Let's read. But if the unbelieving depart, let him, let him depart. A brother or a sister is not under bondage and such Then we let that happen until such time as we can either reconcile with them because they are willing now to allow us to be obedient. And this is important because if a husband said he's thrown us out because he thinks we're in rebellion and we don't agree with him about say decorating the Christmas tree. So he's thrown us out. And after he's, he's tormented us with this for a while, he says, well, you can come back and we come back. And then he says, there's the Christmas tree. I want you to start decorating. Then we need to say, my husband, I, I thought you understood, but I can't do that. And if he throws you out again, then so be it. Because, let's read on why. 
For what knowest thou, O wife, whether thou shalt save thy husband? Or how knowest thou, O man, whether thou shalt save thy wife? But as God hath distributed to every man, so God has blessed each and every one of us as Christians with the truth. As the Lord hath called every one, so let him walk. So if we've been called to be a Christian and we've obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ, if people decide, decide to reject us, to revile us, to deprive us of things that we should be able to trust in, and in the case of a woman throwing us out of a man's household because we're obeying the word, then we let that happen because if we stand in that truth, it's possible that he will miss us and be willing to allow us to return while we still walk in obedience to the word of God. This is how we handle a rebellious husband. We don't give in to him. We don't do what he wants just because he's our husband. So I hope that this has clarified the matter for you, my sister, I, my sisters. And you know what? What I would say is that to be a Christian means that we're willing to suffer for the truth. We're willing to, to have people not like us. We're willing to suffer things like disapproval or even being cast out of our husband's house and having then to figure out how we're going to live without our husband supporting us. And I'm not saying that this is easy. It isn't. And it's particularly difficult if we have a husband who thinks himself to be a Christian and is enlisting the pastor and the pastor's wife and all our family members to convince us that he's right and the word of God is wrong. But if we believe the word of God and that is what is happening, we need to stand in the word of God and keep doing the right thing without preaching to people about how wrong they are, without exalting ourselves as a teacher, rather just living the way God commands a holy woman to live. So we walk in subjection whenever possible. We don't lord it over anybody. We are meek, we are humble, we, are, we dress modestly, we cover our hair, we, we are subject unto our husband in all things until he commands us to do something that the scripture forbids. And then that's a testimony. And if we get thrown out of the house for those reasons, if we get thrown out of the house because we believe the gospel and our family members, including our husband sometimes does not, then we are not under bondage in some such cases. And we must resolve ourselves then to live in solitude, to not remarry, obviously, because we're yet married, to pray for our husband, because our prayers are heard, you know. There's a lot of power in prayer. When we love someone and they're in rebellion, God is not going to make them be obedient, but he will work in their lives. He will deal with them. But we have to get ourselves out of the way first. When we are dealing with rebellion and family members, the answer is not to argue with them. It's not to contend with them. It's not to point out how they're going to hell every other day. It's instead to walk in holiness ourselves that without the word, they might be won by our chaste conversation. We also recognize that while this is a difficult path, it's the cross that a woman sometimes has to bear. And no one ever said that being a Christian was going to be comfortable or easy. Jesus Christ, when he walked to the Christ, he walked, pardon me, when he walked to the cross, he walked alone and he suffered humiliation. He died a tormented death. And just because we're women doesn't mean that we get to have all kinds of drama about our loyalty to Jesus Christ. So we don't make it, we don't try to manipulate people either. So that's the final thing I want to say. When a woman's desire is unto her husband, sometimes she isn't trying to lord it over him or teach him, but she's trying to manipulate him. So she might become tearful. She might pout. 
she might all of a sudden be very depressed and and upset all the time and not able to manage the household and just in some kind of tizzy because they are having a disagreement. This is also incorrect. It's incorrect and it won't bring good fruit, my sister. So if we try to teach our husband and if we try to emotionally manipulate him, then we are in rebellion and he will have a point when he goes to other family members or the pastor or, or what have you about our behavior because our behavior is incorrect. We have to conduct ourselves as the holy women did. So we keep ourselves with a meek and a quiet spirit. We dress modestly, we're obedient to the word of God, and we serve our husbands with grace and dignity until he commands us to do something that we ought not do. And then with grace and humility, we tell him if he's willing to hear us, why? And if he wants to throw us out, then so be it. That is the condition wherein a man who is rebellious might come to repentance. Any other thing that we do, whether it be to manipulate him or to command him, to exalt ourselves over him, those things will increase his rebellion. So my sisters, I hope that this has been helpful to you in explaining, first of all, what it is that is uh, the burden of a woman to have in these times that we have problems in our flesh. Sometimes we feel rebellious. Sometimes we feel really emotional. We want our husband to do what we want him to do. And when we become rebellious as Eve was, so when we, our desire is unto our husband, so we either want to be as he should be unto us by telling him, pardon me, by telling him what to do, or we want to manipulate him and make the whole family miserable until he does what we want. Either of these things is to be acting from our flesh and not being led by the Holy Spirit. Now, for those of you who haven't received the Holy Spirit yet, the place where you find the Holy Spirit is in the Word of God. Jesus Christ said, the words that I speak, they are spirit and they are life. If you haven't received the Holy Spirit yet by uh, speaking in other tongues and glorifying God in an unknown tongue, if that hasn't happened yet, that does not mean that you cannot be led by the Holy Spirit. The way that you would then be until you receive that promised gift, which you will receive, is to dwell in God's word and do what it says. And as you continue in that, then you will find blessings and understanding and whatever is hindering you regarding receiving the Holy Spirit will ultimately be removed. To be a Christian, we need to be willing to walk as a disciple of Jesus Christ and not in our own ways. And the way that we find that is to walk according to the Word of God and the principles that I just explained to you, my sisters. So may the Word of God go forth today and edify many. And I remain here for you, my Email is always in the description box below, or feel free to comment. However, finally, I want to say that the comment section is not for people who want to contend and argue. And people who do that will not be allowed to post comments on this channel. So please take heed unto yourselves. I answer earnest questions and sincere comments, but I don't allow someone to continually just be doubting and, and setting forth all kinds of dilemmas and questions without ever really being willing to learn. And that's not an easy thing for me to do. I don't enjoy doing it. But verily, sometimes I need to do that because there are those of you who want to contend and argue and you you do basically what we just talked about. Either you want to uh, challenge me on every single point or you want to use emotional manipulation and pretend that you're helpless or that you just don't understand. Verily, when I perceive that to be happening, I will forbid you from commenting for a season. And if I do allow you to comment again, I would expect to see a change in that behavior. This is a Christian ministry. It is not a forum for women to, to indulge their, their um, pride by, by tearing down the truth of God's word by contending with me in the comment section. So verily, I do 
urge you all to to uh, write to me to comment if if you indeed you have a sincere question but if you are in a condition where you just want to dispute and argue and pretend that you're a victim and you can't help what you're doing then you're, you're not going to find an audience here all right so i i love you all very much i speak this to you in love because the time is short and jesus christ is coming for a holy bride and you are not going to be able to make excuses to the Lord Jesus Christ about why you were disobedient. And therefore, I need to be a little bit strict with you sometimes. Because verily, we sometimes as women, what we want is we want people to say, oh, they're there now. Honey, I know that it's just too hard for you to be obedient. And I'm not going to indulge that. So I remain here for you, and may the word of God go forth today and edify many. In Jesus' name, amen.